up, there'll be, <clears throat> there'll be a lot more little lips, lips singing praises to Jesus, won't there? Um, we do just praise God for the, uh, the, the decision that the Supreme Court made. A lot of us have been praying for something like that for a long time. Um, but, you know, and it just it reminds us that we're in a culture war. It's, it's really great to praise God in a victory, but it's not over, is it? The culture war is not over. <clears throat> in fact, what that did, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but what the Supreme Court just did was basically kick it back to the states, right? And the voters in the states took it out of the Supreme Court, put it back in the individual states and for voters. <clears throat> to me, that kicks it right back in your lap and <clears throat> my lap. So we need to be telling people about the sanctity of life, that there is a God um, who gave us life, who created life. We need to be doing that so that the voters now will do what we need to be doing. So let's keep that in mind. There is a cultural war going on. There's also a spiritual war going on, isn't there? Uh, for for uh, hearts and minds, for souls, for those people, quote unquote, out there. But there's also a spiritual warfare going on, probably if we admit it within our own heads, is there not? Uh, I don't know about you, but I think that I have to confess that happens, that I'm fighting battles in my mind every day, probably. Um, and the enemy for, in both of those wars, it's not the people with the picket signs. Um, it, it's not where I'm getting information from, per se, but it's Satan, is it not? If we believe the scriptures, there is an evil force out there, an evil creature, and it's Satan. And he is who we are at war with. Um, I, uh, I wanted to touch really on, on the, uh, arm, uh, the armor of God. You can see why I think where I'm headed with this. So this morning I'm gonna to touch on the, uh, the armor, uh, be armed for the battle. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna focus on the breastplate of righteousness and what does it mean to put it on? Uh, <clears throat> I, start, I asked myself that question recently. What does it really mean to put on righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness? What does that mean? <clears throat> and it led to the study that I'm gonna share with you in a moment. Um, also, I'm going to touch on fighting discouragement when we seem to be beaten <clears throat> by ourselves or by someone who's attacked us. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, praise you and uh, thank you. We adore you for who you are. We thank you for loving us. And, um, Lord, I pray that uh, we might have your joy, that it might be our strength. We confess, Lord, that um, we wrestle uh, with all kinds of things. And we ask you to help us as we wrestle through those things, Father, to know you better. Father, we, um, we just thank you for this decision the Supreme Court made, many prayers for many years, and we thank you for these people. I pray to protect them uh, in the coming days, and also uh, everyone who stands for life, Father, that you'd be protecting them. I pray, Lord, that um, you'd be with us this morning. Uh, guide us from your word. Uh, I pray that, Lord, anything I say that would be useful would be remembered, anything not would be quickly forgotten. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So um, I'm going to um, going to be speaking mostly from Ephesians today, but I'm going to jump around some on you, so you can uh, try to keep up if you like. But um, I'll be in Ephesians mostly. Uh, <clears throat> Ephesians uh, is a letter written by Paul. Uh, you might recall, just to give you a little quick background, he's writing it to believers. That's the main point. Uh, what's coming in Ephesians is written to believers. It's good to know that. Um, he reminds uh, the, those readers, he reminds us then of uh, our, our salvation, first of all. I'm just going to hit on a few major points in Ephesians that kind of tie into this business of what does it mean to put on the breastplate of righteousness, at least to me. So, um, first of all, the, the Ephesians verse that always jumps out that I just love to cling to is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can, can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So I always think that when I hear saved by grace, I usually think about Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 right away. We're saved by grace. That's one of the main thrusts of uh, Ephes the book of Ephesians. Um, uh, another place uh, I'd like to land on just for a minute. Well, actually, before I do that, let me go to Spurgeon right away. You know, uh, uh, Gail has this collection of, of, uh, of sermons from Spurgeon. And so I went there to see if there might be some things that would apply here. And uh, today I'm going to pull two or three things out of several of his sermons. And I think it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's almost a testimony to something we're going to mention at the very end of this message. And that is that the truth 
doesn't doesn't die. It just stays. It keeps going. You know, this guy Spurgeon uh, uh, had his messages given back about 170 years ago in England, and he was a young man in his 20s and 30s. So you can imagine me now pulling in Spurgeon over here, this kid, he's younger than David even, right? This kid and uh, saying, hey, help me out here, will you? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna expound on, on something here. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm gonna pull this from one of his uh, sermons. I'm not sure if it was in his 20s or 30s, somewhere in there. Let's see here, here we go. Um, Okay, so this kind of ties in with uh, being saved by grace or being saved. Is it important to be saved? <laughs> I just, I, now remember, this was written 170 years ago, so bear with me in the language, but that's part of what adds to it to me. It makes me think about it a little differently. He says this in his sermon. I trust I do not address today any men so idiotic as to desire to forget the certainty of death or to thrust the fact from their remembrance. <clears throat> I trust that being sane men you desire to look in the face of the whole of your future history, both in the present world and, and in worlds beyond the region of sight, and foreseeing that soul and body must part in the article of death. You are desirous to consider that event, <clears throat> that you may be prepared for it. You desire to take death into your reckoning so that you may not, it may not surprise you unaware. He should, here's an example now he gives. He who should go on a long journey and provide for every difficulty on the road but one would probably find the journey a failure. If a rolling chariot for the solid ways, he had forgotten to, to find the means of crossing the last river which would divide him from the country which he, uh, which he sought, he would be disappointed after all his pains. If you have provided for life but have not also prepared for death, what better what better will you be, my hearer, than the foolish traveler? Well, there's kind of interesting perspective, huh? Um, I want to be prepared. And one other place I'd like to read from, from another sermon. Let's see. Yeah, this will tie in a little more now with the breastplate of righteousness. I think this is interesting, and hopefully this will make you think a little bit. Imagine, as before I read this, imagine now that um, I'm, I would do to you what he's do, suggesting doing here. <clears throat> I would ask you to all to form a single file line, and one by one you'd come by, and I would ask you a question, and you would have to give me an answer, okay? So that's what he's picturing here. Now, if I wish to test you all and might ask you only one question, I would ask this. What is your righteousness? Now come along, single file. What is your righteousness? Here's the first one, <clears throat> first answer. Oh, I am as good as my neighbors. Get along with you. You are not my comrade. I ask again, what is your righteousness? Next answer. <clears throat> well, I am rather better than my neighbors, for I go to chapel regularly. Off with you, sir. You do not know the watchword. And you next, what is your righteousness? I have been baptized and I am a member of a church. <clears throat> yes, and so you may. And if that is your hope, you are in, go in the gall of bitterness. Now you next, what is your hope? <clears throat> oh, I do all I can and Christ makes up the rest. Rubbish, you are a Babylonian, you are no Israelite. Christ is no make -weight. away with you. Here comes the last. What is your righteousness? My righteousness is filthy rags, except one righteousness which I have, which, is, which Christ wrought out for me on Calvary, imputed to me by God himself, which makes me pure and spotless as an angel. <clears throat> ah, brother, you and I are now fellow soldiers. I have found you out. That is the watchword. Your righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I do not ask whether you are a Christian or whether you are Methodist or Independents or Baptist. If you do not know that watchword, your righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I can forgive other things, but not that. It's interesting, huh? It makes you think. I don't know about you. I shared that with you because when I read that, it really made me think that through, you know. And what I, where am I putting my faith? Where am I putting my trust? 
I hope that uh, you could all be like that last guy. I hope that all of us here are like that last answer. Um, so what else is going on back in Ephesians? Back to Ephesians. I'm going to verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 6 now. It says this. Um, what is Paul telling us in Ephesians again as we build up to the armor of God? Paul's telling the Ephesians, Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent and, pers and persevere in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also, just, <clears throat> just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One last part of Ephesians here I wanted to, to read from is chapter 4 again, but verses 31 through 5, 2. Then we'll get on to the uh, armor. <clears throat> So also Paul tells the Ephesians, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. And finally now we'll get to the, uh, the armor of God, I think, here. Before I do, I'd like to just share a little something that, that uh, uh, I think it was Tony Evans said in one of the things I was reading. He's talking about how the things I just read there, the, the, what's in Ephesians early on, is a lot about interactions with people. And we know how important relationships are to God. We've talked about that before. He wants us to be in harmony with one another. And, but that's a problem because we're not perfect. And so uh, we have a lot of struggles with each other from time to time. And so uh, Tony Evans was quick to point out <clears throat> that uh, people are the problem when we try to do that. Um, they, are, they appear to us as the problem. They're what we see, but they're not really the problem. The real problem is just like we talked about at the very beginning. It's what's going on behind the scenes. It's these battles that are going on in our head. It's, it's Satan throwing things at us <clears throat> that want to throw us off track or giving us, accusing us, excuse me, accusing us or accusing others. And so um, it's not, uh, it's not a struggle against each other physically, but it is. But the real struggle is a spiritual one. And hence, we need the armor of God. And so that's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, <clears throat> which I'll read now. I think you're all familiar with this. I'm going to read through all the, um, the uh, parts of the armor of God, and I'm going to come back and zero in on that breastplate of righteousness. So now I'm in Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his mighty, in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, um, if I stop there, that's a pretty grim picture, isn't it? <laughs> Very grim picture. That's why I'm so glad, you know, we start off there with being saved by grace. We have a mighty war here. We have the King of Kings, the Lords of Lords, is on our side. <clears throat> and he can go deal in those areas anytime he wants. So that's who we are allied with. That's who our, um, uh, our, our, our master is. But I'm going on then. What are we told to do by Paul? Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in, in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with, with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the sword, word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in this in the spirit and with this in view be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints I like it kind of ends there petitions for all the saints praying for one another so that's the armor of God so I had a question um, uh, these all part all these parts are really important all these parts of the armor must be important or they wouldn't be written down for us there 
Um, but what does it mean to put on the breastplate of righteousness? We put on other things too, but that's one of them. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I think you may have seen pictures like I have of what the Roman soldiers uh, wore and all that stuff and what a breastplate looked like and how they had took, took some time to get dressed up in that stuff and how it would protect your chest from uh, any, any missiles coming in at you along with your shield. Um, but that breastplate of righteousness, uh, you had to put it on, right? So when it says put it on, and I picture this in spiritual warfare, I'm thinking, okay, how do I put on, I, I was picture, I always find myself doing this, how do I put on <laughs> this breastplate of righteousness? And then I go, I have to back up a little from that even, frankly, and uh, even though I've been a Christian for many years, I had to stop and say, well, wait a minute, what, what is righteousness? What, what is this righteousness that we're putting on? And so um, I just did a little word study on that in, in a number of places, and I wanted to share some of that with you. It probably re should be a reminder to most, I would think. Uh, but it was kind of an interesting perspective. Before I get to that, though, I just want to share with you the timing on this. You know how a lot of times when uh, God does something and, and you have to be there, be part of it, and part of the timing to really appreciate it? Um, that's, that happened to me uh, just recently. As I was preparing this message and studying some of the stuff I'm studying, I was talking to a dear brother of mine, Christian brother, um, and so I, I, and another thing came to mind, uh, Bruce Rezengada, our, our interim pastor, suggested asking questions a lot. So um, that's, that happened to strike me at, the, at this moment. So I asked my, I was pondering this question in my mind. I was sitting next to my brother, and, uh, and, and then I thought of another brother who said, ask questions. So I asked a question, said to this guy, said, let me ask you something. You've heard of the armor of God, right? He said, yeah. I said, what does it mean to you to put on the armor of, of, of the breastplate of righteousness? He's like, where, you know, where's that come from? I said, well, I think I've been wondering about this. Let me ask. So, yeah, okay, I'll tell you. He, so he did what I did. He, said, he says, well, I put on this, I put on that. The things he was putting on were much what I was thinking about, too. Uh, well, I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. I want to do this. I want to, I want to, I want to spend time with my Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, I want to study. Uh, I want to follow the God's commands. I want to do this. That's putting on righteousness. I said, yeah, I kind of I, I kind of understand that. That's what I've been thinking, too. Uh, but but to me, that <clears throat> there had to be something more. Um, and yet to be putting on righteousness to me was uh, very presumptuous. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm like, who am I to think I could even pick up righteousness, let alone put it on? Who am I to do that? Um, so I wanted to figure this out. I mean, we're told to do it. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. What is it all about? Um, I, so my, my friend told me much of what I was thinking, putting on righteousness. But then I thought, no, there's got to be more because if that's all there is, my breastplate's going to be falling off all the time. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen. I want, it to, I want to be more sure of, my, of this breastplate. So I want to study and see what this is, which is what I did. And the study showed me that, yes, there is. Uh, much more to it, much more to it than, than putting on those things. Nothing wrong with that, I think, from what I read, but there's more to it. And I, I'm sure you, most of you know where I'm headed with this, and that it won't be a big surprise. But before I go on, let me just define righteousness a little bit, if I may, or share what I read about the definition of righteousness. In the Old Testament, uh, con when, when you look at concordances that are relating to righteousness in the Old Testament, uh, predominantly, you get things like this. Uh, uh, righteousness is it's God's people, those who honor God and live per his will. They have personal relationship with God that manifests itself in daily living. There's a faithful response to God's revealed directions for life. Um, in the Old Testament, you'll remember too, this kind of goes back to how we started. Righteousness is personal, but it's also collective. Righteousness exalts a nation, you remember from Proverbs or not. Uh, in the Old Testament, Noah was said to be a righteous man, blameless in his time. Abraham believed in the Lord, and he was reckoned, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In the New Testament, Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a righteous man. In the gospel, a, righteous, uh, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last. So that last one is probably the most profound, I think, right? This goes back to being saved by grace. This last one is the New Testament. Now, that's Romans 1.17 I just quoted from. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So 
in that sense, I'm going to I'm going to give it kind of the bottom line, not a front, but in the middle here. Bottom line in the middle here is that there's a righteousness we can put on if we remember that Jesus died for us and he made, he gave us his righteousness when he did that. So it's not uh, it's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. I remember that he's given me that breastplate of righteousness. But then on top of that, there is this thing we call sanctification. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we are we're we're saved and then we grow more into the image of Christ. I think most of us are on the same page there. Some of this stuff gets pretty difficult theologically, but just that's where I that's my understanding of, the, of our scriptures so in a commentary it said Christ died to pay the penalty for our sin and lived a life of perfect righteousness that in turn it could be impugned to us you heard that word in the earlier uh, verse impugned so <laughs> what's impugned mean I've heard that word for a long time I thought I kind of knew what it was what what's impugned mean so I looked it up and uh, it means to be treated as if it is ours to be treated as if it is ours in this case righteousness now think about that a minute amazing grace is tough to to start to describe there's tough to come up with an allegory for this um closest thing i can come up to come up with is maybe an inheritance but there's a drastic difference too it's kind of exciting to think about um if if my parents had a lot of money and they died and left it to me suddenly that money is mine it's it's counted as mine it's, it is mine, and it's counted as mine, right? But that's not a very good analogy of what we have with Christ because mom and dad didn't die. <laughs> you know? Christ is alive. Our Heavenly Father is alive. Christ <clears throat> is alive. Cool, huh? So we have an inheritance. Somehow we, we've, he's, we've been given something just as if it's ours by our Lord Jesus who died a death to pay a price so that he could impugn his righteousness to us. He gives it to you. He gives it to you. It's your breastplate of righteousness. Cool, huh? Very cool. And it kind of goes beyond a good analogy. Like I said, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Excuse me. I can't see. I can't see. Um... I did want to share uh, something from, well, let me go to Romans first. Let's see here, Romans. I'm in th uh, chapter 3, and I'm going to be 21 through 26. Justification by faith. But from that, but now, <clears throat> apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption with which is in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because... In the forbearance of God, he passed over the, the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at this present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who, is, who has by faith, who has faith in Jesus. So you hear a lot about faith, huh? It's all about faith, having faith in Christ for when, what he did for us. And then him impugning his righteousness to us. So the first part of righteousness, the, probably the, the central, the core, the most majestic part, the most powerful part of our breastplate righteousness is what's given to us. We don't put it on in a sense. So what does it mean to put it on? I think it just means remember, remember. It helps put to, pictures are helpful to me and you, I think. So Christ died years, many years ago for my sins and your sins, and he gave me the righteousness that's part of my breastplate or is my breastplate, but I have to remember to put it on when I get up in the morning. Remember, I've been saved. Um, if not, I'm, I'm leaving myself open for, for vul being vulnerable. I don't lose my salvation by not remembering I have a breastplate on, I don't think. I'm sure that's not true, but, um, but maybe it's loosened a bit, or maybe it's not on quite straight or something because I haven't snugged it up with what I need to do. And that's the second part of this. 
So it seems to me that there are two forms of righteousness that can be uh, thought of when we think about putting on the breastplate of righteousness, at least. Um, and it, they fit real well, I think, with the, uh, how, what the Bible teaches about justification and sanctification, right? Imputed righteousness is when Jesus died, and that's God's gift. There's salvation from eternal life to from eternal death to eternal life, um, and that's with the Creator, the eternal life with the Creator, the one who loves us and created us, and wants to be with us. Went to all that trouble to to forgive us, so we could be with Him for eternity. That loving Father, um, He imputed this righteousness to us. This is what we call justification, just as if I'd never sinned is a nice way to remember that, I think. Just as if I'd never sinned. Hard to, it's kind of hard to wrap our heads around that sometimes, but that's what it essentially means. So that imputing of righteousness, the breastplate of the righteousness has been imputed to me, it's all from God. I don't have anything to do with that other than knowing it's there now. Um, and then there's something, and I'm going to coin a new phrase here that I couldn't come up with, couldn't find a good one anywhere, so I've just coined this myself. Applied righteousness. Imputed righteousness is justification. Applied righteousness, being made holy by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit in daily living. That's sanctification. That's sanctification. So now that goes back to what my friend told me. This is what I'm putting on now. These are the decisions that I make. That's the easiest way to maybe to focus down on this. It's decisions that I make. Am I going to do the right thing or am I going to do the wrong thing? I, if you're anything like me, I still get those choices every day. And I wish I could say I always did the right thing, but maybe I don't always do the right thing. Could be I don't do something I'm supposed to do, for example. So my breastplate then, as I put on righteousness again, it really boils down to, okay, I think what it's telling me is remember the righteousness that Christ has already given you. And then you want to be more like him? Keep putting on stuff. Keep making good decisions, not bad ones. Uh, uh, study your Bible. Do your praying. Spend time with Christian brothers and sisters, and so on. So, um, uh, the nice thing about this is, this interesting thing about too, it's not all work. It's not works yet. Still, it's not still not just me, because the scriptures are pretty clear. The Holy Spirit is in the middle of this, right? Jesus said He sent the Holy Spirit to us when He went away, before He comes back. And so the Holy Spirit is at work in us, either convicting when we uh, have done something wrong or encouraging when we've done something right. I bet you you've experienced it much like I have. You know, we, some people might call it a conscious. That might, may or may not be how that works in. But there's something going on in our minds and in our activities during the day where we get senses. Well, I think that's the right thing to do. Maybe I should go do that. And I can choose. Nope, I don't have time for that. I'm not going to do that. Well, then I might feel some conviction about that later. That's the Holy Spirit at work in us, I believe. So, um, again, put on the breastplate of righteousness. What's the answer to that question? My question was, what does it mean to put on the breastplate of righteousness? Again, I think it means remember Christ died for your sin. You are saved. Don't fear. Even death. Christ already won the battle. <clears throat> Work on sanctification, and the other part of it is work on sanctification through prayer, study. Uh, make decisions to obey God's written uh, commands, and make decisions to obey the Holy Spirit's leading. <clears throat> so now, I kind of answered the question I started off with, but then as, as this went through the study, some other things popped out I wanted to share with you before we close today. Um, I will have a little, a few more minutes. Um, so you may be sitting there kind of wondering and asking yourself the question, oh, that all sounds real nice, John, you know, but I've, and I know what you're talking about. I've been there. I know what you're talking about. But what if I make an ungodly decision and I actually sin? What, what happens if I do the wrong thing? You know? Well, one of the commentaries I read expressed it pretty well. I think this makes sense to me. Unrighteous acts are like an open invitation for satanic invasion. Um, and again, that makes me think back to, well, maybe I shift my breastplate a little bit a lot. I'm not losing salvation, but I'm open to, to, to uh, attack now. And when, I'm, when I've made an improper decision and done something wrong, whatever that might be, uh, I'm in trouble for a while uh, until I do something about it. And Scripture, thank goodness, God's given us everything we need. It's in Scripture what to do next. If I catch myself feeling like, oh, man, I'm no good. I'm a bum. Look what I did, right? I, I, I screwed up again. He tells us what to do. 
Um, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, right? So we shouldn't, let, we shouldn't languish in that spot where we fell down. And uh, no, we should, we should be humble. Um, uh, we should be humble before the Lord and, and ask for his forgiveness. Do, does this lead us to a place where now um, we, we don't repent? Uh, I don't think so. Um, in Romans 6, 1 and 2, you might recall. Let me get them over there now. Yeah, Romans 6, 1 and 2. Remember uh, what was said here. What shall we do then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound, might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So yeah, we may trip and fall, but while we're down and we need to be humble, come to the for the Lord, pray First John 1, 9. Confess our sins and uh, uh, ask for his forgiveness. And it says that he will, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Just the opposite, right? If we ask God, he'll purify us from all unrighteousness so we get back into that righteous state. Um, let, me, uh, let me go on then to say, well, you know, you might, ask, you might ask, what if the thoughts of failure persist? You know, so maybe I did what you just said, John. I did that prayer, and yet I still just don't feel right. I, something keeps bugging me, and, and I, 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 I don't feel right. Um, I would suggest that what we need to do, and I've heard this shared with me before from some counselor at some point, well, examine those thoughts. Examine where is that coming from. Is it conviction, or is it condemnation? Think about that a minute. Is it conviction, or is it condemnation? If it's conviction... Does it seem like it's coming then from a loving God trying to build you up? Is it the Holy Spirit that's, that's at work in you saying, yeah, you're right. You did screw up, <laughs> but you don't have to stay that way. Come back to me and I'll forgive you <clears throat> and I'll give I'll help you stand up again. You know, that would be the Holy Spirit, of course. Or is it is it uh, that'd be conviction or is it condemnation? Um, Condemnation would be more like, you're never going to be any good anymore. You blew it. It's all over for you. You're, you're, you're rotten to the core. You know, that kind of thing. Along those lines, I wanted to share with you something from one of Spurgeon's sermons again. This is another place to me where I read this. I thought, man, this guy wrote this 170 years ago. Some, some kid in his 20s or 30s. And yet it sounds so much like some of the stuff C.S. Lewis has written that, that impressed me years ago uh, as far as uh, how to deal with some of, these, um, some of these attacks, these spiritual attacks that we're supposed to put on armor for to fight these spiritual attacks. So here's another, another place. Um, let me see, 161, 162, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Again, uh, I think having the, the language, being, being this older language, somehow it makes me think a little more when I read it. So let me, I, I'd encourage you to, to hang with me here. Uh, this is uh, Spurgeon writing now, who, by the way, at this point, he's already a very popular pastor, um, sharing to thousands, I think, in London. Um, well, it was thousands in London. Here's what he says. There is one that has risen against me in judgment many times. I dare to say he has troubled many of the dear people of the Lord here. <clears throat> that is Satan. He is always rising in judgment against us. Whenever we get into a little trouble, he comes and says, you are no saint. If we commit a sin, you would not sin like that. If you had been called of God, you have no interest in the covenant. You are an enthusiast. You have deceived yourself. How many times Satan has risen against me in judgment? So risen that I have been fool enough to heed what he said. I have told him sometimes, you're a liar and the father of lies. But at other times, I have believed the, his malicious accusations. Oh, it is no easy thing to stand against the insidious, uh, the, ins the, the insu ins 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 got this word wrong, the uh, insinuations, there we go of the evil one. You, my brethren, are not strangers to his devices. He has set conscience at you. 
The hellhounds of legal convictions howled upon you, and the drum of terrible doom thundered in your ears. Then up stood the fiend himself and denied your, your union with Jesus, claiming, that you, claiming you as his own prey and portion. Well, I'm so glad he turns this before he leaves us. He says, this, ah, how glorious the moment when our advocate entered the realm, or excuse me, entered the form of conscience and saved us, excuse me, and assured us that he had pleaded our cause in the court of the king's bench above. So Christ coming back into the picture there. Um, sorry. Uh, have you been there? Have you been there? I wanted to read that today because it resonates with me. <clears throat> Again, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote some similar things to that years ago that resonated with me at the time. And this resonated with me again. And so we need to recognize when we're being attacked like that. We need to recognize it and fend it off. Use our armor. Okay, um, so uh, to answer that question, what if thoughts of, of, uh, of, of failure persist? Decide if it's the Holy Spirit or not. And, and if it's the Holy Spirit, it's gonna be trying to encourage or build up. If it's not the Holy Spirit, chances are it's someone trying to condemn you and keep you in a hole where you can't be standing up and doing what God wants you to do. And so if that's the case, you want to fight back and not follow that voice. And then how do we, um, how do we have the strength, the, the encouragement, the optimism to fight somebody like Satan? He's been around a long time. And uh, all these helpers, however that works, they know how things work, and they know you, and they know me. So how do we fight that? Well, what comes to mind is, from my reading is, number one, remember. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus died for you and me. We have that eternal security. Put on that breastplate, for starters. Uh, and that's, that's really the end of the story in a lot of ways. Uh, there's a, um, uh, a verse then I'm going to borrow from Spurgeon again here that... Um, uh, he, he, he encourages us, basically, with this verse. And so I just wanted to share it with you as well. And then a little bit that he says about it. Um, he goes to um, Isaiah 54, 17, which says, No weapon that has been formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall, be, that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I love it that, he, that that's in that verse because uh, then I was wondering, I, I don't know about you, when I read scripture, sometimes I'll be saying, well, who's talking here? First of all, who's talking? Is it God or is it a prophet? Who is it? And then who is he talking to? You know. So in this case, this is Isaiah speaking for God. And now it's not, uh, no mistake about who this is intended for because it says, uh, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So if we feel that we are servants of the Lord because we've trusted God as our Savior and we're trying to follow him, if we are servants of the Lord, this applies to us. And what does apply to us? Let me read it again. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. I thought this was interesting. Um, that uh, uh, if we it, now we're, we can we can not, not not only use this for defense, which is what a lot of this armor was, we're standing there and all, but we can also use it for our offense. If we really believe what I just read, we can now be more um, uh, active in sharing our faith and sharing our truth out there because the truth that goes out there is going to serve its purpose, <clears throat> whether we see the results or not, and the truth is going to make itself known. There was a, uh, there's a let's see if I can find it here. I'm not sure I had this real handy, but uh, there was an interesting, yeah, here it is. Interesting, this kind of came up in Sunday school today. I didn't have time to share it, Phil, sorry, but uh, uh, I thought this was cool. Um, I like this too, this resonated with me. This is something Spurgeon wrote 170 years ago, but it resonated with me because uh, it fit perfectly with something I talked with, with a, I guess I can say this, a fellow scientist once in, um, uh, in New Mexico. We were doing a test all night long, and so we had all this time to talk while this test was going on, and we talked about many things. One of the things he said was he felt that 
eventually science would show that there is a God so clearly that no one can deny it anymore. That we will unveil enough about creation that'll show there has to be a creator, there is a God. And so there's no denying there is a God. So then the only decision left for anyone is gonna be, I don't want him anyway. I still wanna be myself, see? So throughout my career, I've just been excited to see different things that we learn and discover. Sometimes people will say that's not, um, See, there's evidence there's no God. Well, wait a couple years and you'll find, they usually find out there's something that was going on there. Oh, well, we didn't understand that after all. There's gotta be something else going on, you know? Uh, bacterial flagellum is one of those things. Have you ever heard of that? That's in the biological world, biological sciences. We can talk about that more later, but uh, uh, interesting stuff. There's all kinds of things that we're still discovering as we go along. I th sometimes I can't wonder if God might not be going, might not be going oh, that's, that's fun, look what, they figured, look what they figured out this time. Look what they figured out this year, you know. Um, but what Spurgeon says about this in relation to uh, science and, and God, I thought was pretty cool, he says this. Each one of the sciences has, in its imperfect condition, been used as a battering ram against the truth of God. But as soon as it has been understood, it has been made a pillar in Zion's outworks. Isn't that cool kind of picture? Uh, literally picture a battering ram. We, oh, we could tear this door down with this thing, you know. Oh no, we find out, oh, this thing, it's, it's not what we thought it was. Oh, well, what is it? Well, it's, it explains that there is a God. There must be a creator. There's gotta be a greater power somewhere. Open minds, I always like the definition of, uh, scientists do get a, most of, many deserve a bad rap, but scientists, uh, a good scientist, I've always heard the good, the definition of a good scientist is one, who follows the truth wherever it leads him. I, I think that may, that's okay with me, as long as he follows the truth wherever it leads him and doesn't try to force it where he doesn't want to go or where he doesn't think it should go. Um, so let's see, uh, uh, last thing here then on that verse that I just mentioned, I'm gonna read it again just because it's, I think it is powerful if we really latch hold of it. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall thou shalt condemn this is the heritage of the servants of the lord and of their righteousness and their righteousness is of me saith the lord and then the last thing from spurgeon i wanted to share if i can find it here quickly let's see here we go yeah i like this because now this this deals with going on the offense we can go on offense because that sword, which was part of the armor, was the truth of God, right? That's what we're told. God's truth is not going to be put down by any man, by any science. Uh, God's truth is going to go forward, so and it's going to last. <clears throat> so uh, there may be somebody here who doesn't really agree with most of what I've been saying. Uh, I hope that's not true. I guess we're online, so there may be somebody that would, that would watch this that... Uh, would disagree and hasn't had a chance to uh, to respond be, be be happy to respond to, to have a conversation with someone if they wanted to be in touch with me but um, let me share this this last part here now from Spurgeon again 170 years ago but I know there are some of my hearers who believe and love the doctrines of grace and sometimes you are called to dispute and contend for them I know you are I trust you are. I hope you love to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. I know what it is, excuse me, I know what is the case with many of you. When you come to plead with an unbeliever, you do not know what to say. Has it not, has it not been so with you many a time? You have said, I almost wish I could hold my tongue for the man has confounded me. Yet remember, every tongue shall rise against thee in judgment. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Last time you had that dispute, you thought your adversary conquered. Did you not? You thought wrong. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> he might glory in his intellectual prowess. He might say, oh, that man is nothing to me. <laughs> but... Leave him alone till he gets to bed. And when the hours of darkness are around him, he will seriously begin to think. He conquered you with his appearance, in appearance, but now you master him. 
or wait till he's sick. And then your words shall ring in his ears. They shall come up again from the grave if he should arise, if he should survive you, and you will conquer him then. Do not be afraid to argue for the truth. Do not think that infidels are wise men, or Arminians are so exceedingly learned. Stand up for the truth. And there is so much solid learning and real truth to be found in the doctrines that we uphold that none of you need to be ashamed of them. They are mighty and must prevail. The mighty God of Joseph of Jacob, by the, de by the demonstration of the Holy Ghost, makes them triumphant. It makes them triumphant. God's word's going to stand, folks, you know, whether we share it or not. But he asked us to share it. We can be part of that. And if we feel defeated, I've, done, I've felt that way before. Man, I spent an hour talking to that guy, and I don't think I got anywhere. Oh, no, that's not true. God's word says it doesn't go forth void. So seeds have been planted. And it may well be that that person is, is on their bed that night. Or maybe their deathbed a year later. Maybe you've already died yourself, like he says. And those words of truth are still going to be bouncing around. And they'll do what they were intended to do. So we don't want to be afraid. We want to put on armor. We want to put on that breastplate of righteousness. Remember that it's Christ that has done that for us. It's all him, not us. Secondly, we are to build on that. We are to be constantly working on the sanctification thing. So we are to be studying his word and trying to do the things he wants us to do, listening to the Holy Spirit. And then in a, as, as we're doing that, we're commanded to share the truth. And don't be afraid to share the truth, even if you don't see results. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you for, um, for again, for who you are. We thank you for this victory that has been won with the Supreme Court. Uh, we thank you for all the lives that uh, hopefully will be impacted when states make the right decisions, more godly decisions. Father, give us the courage to, uh, to, to do what you want us to do. Help us to put on the full armor of God from, from uh, head to foot. Uh, but that breastplate of righteousness, thank you so much that we can have confidence that uh, you have given that to us. Help us to remember to put it on and help us to remember to continue to build on that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.